Well, good morning, everyone. And can I say congratulations, well done for braving the, the wind and the rain and everything. We're obviously a few people short because of that, um, but that's okay. They, they're going to miss out on the opportunity to, to, to gather together, to sing God's praises, to hear from God's word. What a shame, they're going to miss out on those things. Um, some of you will be aware that in September, we've got a thing called... Next. Yep, called Spring Into Life. Spring Into Life. And that, in that, uh, that fortnight, we're going to be spending some time, um, share, well, we're going to be trying, aiming to share our faith with others, and we're going to be inviting people to come and hear the gospel uh, explained and uh, to seek to respond to that. And so what we thought we'd do in the weeks leading up to that is we're going to spend a little bit of time in each of our services just doing a little bit of kind of training and preparation for that, okay? So we've already given out, you will have been given out a, a little piece of paper uh, with a sheet that you can write three names of three people on it. Um, a little bit later in the service, I'm going to be asking you to think about these two questions. Why do you believe in God? Why do you go to church? Okay, so I'm going to ask you to think about that. And we're actually going to talk about this in church. I know it's a bit weird. Um, so I'm going to ask you to think about that. Uh, so you might like to start ruminating about that idea at the moment. Why do you believe in God? Why do you go to church? Imagine if somebody asked you that question, what would you say? Everybody's got a question. I mean, you're here. There must be some reason why you're here. <laughs> Um, what's, uh, what is it that brings you to church today? Why do you go to church? I'm going to pray for us and then I'm going to go back and, and get ready f for the first song um, where we're going to sing a song of praise to God together. But while, while we're kind of sitting up, I want you to think about those questions. Why do you go to church? Why do you believe in God? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together like this, um, to meet around your word, uh, to sing your praises, to share in the Lord's Supper together and all the great blessings of fellowship. Uh, thank you for our regular members and for our visitors who are here. Um, Lord, it's great to be together. Um, Lord, thank you that you've promised that when we gather that you are here. And so we pray, Lord, that you'd be with us in everything that happens today. Uh, we pray that uh, our, our words would be honouring to you, that we would be uplifted and strengthened and encouraged for our walk with you this week. Uh, we commit this service to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing our first song, Oh, Praise the Name.
please take a seat, everyone. Welcome if you've come in while we're singing. My name is John. I'm one of the ministers here. Great to have you all with us. And kids, before we head outside to our program, we're going to do something very special and we'll include the grown-ups in it too, okay? And what it is, is something called communion or the Lord's Supper. You see, we've just been singing some songs praising God uh, for all the things that he's done for us. And uh, one of the great things he's done for us is send his son Jesus. And uh, we know all these great things that God has done uh, because when we gather together, we read God's Bible and we, we sing these songs and we remind ourselves of all the things that God has done for us and all the things we believe about God. So we're going to say some things now a whole lot of great things we believe about God, okay? Uh, they're often called creeds. Uh, for thousands of years, Christians have called these, said these things together called creeds, which is just uh, something, it's just saying what we believe, saying together a whole lot of great things we believe about God and what he's done for us through Jesus. So before we share in the Lord's Supper or communion together, we're going to uh, say this children's creed, which is based on the words of one of those really, really old creeds called the Apostles' Creed. And now if you can't read yet, that's okay. Just listen in as we all say together what we believe and you think about what's being said. And for those who can read, uh, let's declare what we believe together. With all Christians everywhere, we believe in one God. We believe in God the Father, maker of all things. We believe in Jesus Christ, Lord and Saviour of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, giver of life and light. The Father sent his Son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus rose again as Lord of all that we might live forever with him. God sent his Holy Spirit to live in us so we may grow more like Jesus. We belong to the church, God's family everywhere. Amen. So that's one really helpful way for us to get ready for sharing in uh, the Lord's Supper together. Uh, another helpful way is to be honest with God about what we've done and how sorry we are for all the things that need forgiving. Uh, you see, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Uh, and this is the greatest and the most important commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But we know that during this week, and maybe even already today, we have not loved God or others as we should. This uh, selfish attitude and rebellious behavior is what the Bible calls sin. And the important thing to realize is that sin puts a barrier between us and God. So let's say sorry to our loving God for all the wrong things we've done. Okay. Dear God, Thank you that you love us and care for us all the time. We know that this week we have not always lived the way you want us to. We have done wrong things and we have not done all the good things we should have done. We are sorry. Only you can save us, so please forgive us and help us to live as your friends. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 to 8, and kids, this is going to be our memory verse for the next few weeks, uh, it says that Christ sacrificed his life's blood to set us free, which means our sins are now forgiven. Christ did this because of God's gift of undeserved grace to us. So what that means is because of Jesus... God forgives everyone who repents, that means says sorry and turns back to him. He forgives all those who turn to his son as saviour and lord. So we're free now to live God's way, not our way. Free to live without guilt or shame. Free to live lives of love and good deeds as we wait for Jesus to return. Now ever since the first Easter, the weekend that Jesus died and rose again, 
friends of Jesus have actually eaten bread and uh, drank together as they share in the Lord's Supper together. Jesus actually told his friends to do this as a way of remembering his death on the cross and his rising from the dead. Remembering all of that because uh, he did that, it means our sins are forgiven and we're promised life forever. So what we're going to do now is remember that Jesus died and rose again for us by sharing in the Lord's Supper. Now, if, if you don't think it would be right for you to participate, please use this time to, to reflect on what's being said as we hear about God's love for us in Christ. And uh, we uh, encourage the children to participate as a way of them learning what it means to be part of God's family. Obviously, when they're old enough to make decisions for themselves, uh, they will have to own that for themselves. But uh, in the meantime, uh, if you're happy with your children participating, we are as well. Now, the words are going to appear on the screen. I'm going to say all the things in the, the slanty writing. And... Uh, I did have it in different colours, it's changed. Anyway, uh, I'm going to say all the things in the leaning over writing, you say the things in the normal writing. Okay. So in joy and thanksgiving, let us continue to praise the Lord our God. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Yes, he is worthy of our praise. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Therefore, with all those gathered around your throne in heaven, we lift our voices to praise you, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. We praise you especially for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Well, we're going to uh, pass around uh, some little pieces of bread and some little cups of juice uh, to share. Now, hold on to them. Don't... Have, don't eat them or drink them just yet because we'll eat and drink together uh, at the right time in the service. Uh, if you need a gluten-free option, we have those, so just stick your hand up and we'll get that to you. And uh, while we're handing it out, we're actually going to sing uh, some more praises to God and think about uh, who he is and how he has saved us. So the band will come up, but just stay sitting down for this song. So we'll sing this song sitting down while we pass out the bread and the juice. Welcome if you've just arrived. We're uh, sharing in the Lord's Supper together. And uh, as I said before, I say all the things that are in uh, italics. If you say the things that are not in italics, I think you should know what that means. So let's pray together. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we who receive these gifts of your creation, this bread and this wine, according to our Saviour's command, in remembrance of his suffering and death, may share in his body and blood. Amen. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after the meal, he took the cup. And again, giving you thanks, Lord, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them, meaning our Saviour's word, may share his body and blood. To Jesus Christ who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. 
Okay, well, if you'd like to pass your cups towards the aisles, they'll be collected. And kids, it's time for us to head out for our program. We have little kids at church for the preschoolers and kids at church for those who go to big school. And uh, because of the weather, uh, the insurer won't let us use the shed for our children's programs in wild weather. So we're all together in the cottage today. I know, that's a bit annoying. But uh, we're heading out now to our kids' program and we'll be back at morning tea. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, there are a few things uh, happening today. So just a reminder, uh, for those of you who are regular members of the church, during the week you will have received an email reminder from me um, to respond about the building project. If you haven't done that yet, there are a number of sheets that I'm about to pull out magically from in front of me. Um, sheets of paper. Basically, if you're a regular member and you haven't replied about the building project, I'd love to hear from you what you think of it. Um, and so if you could just fill in one of these, basically all you need is to say, yes, I, the building project or the building idea, just general principles. We're not looking at the big details just yet. There's lots of work needs to be done on the details and plans. So, um, but we're just wanting to know if people are generally happy with where we're going and the direction we're going. Um, and so if, that's, if you're supportive of that, then if you could circle the A. If you don't like the pro, the the way the building was presented a couple of weeks ago um, and you were wanting us to do something different, then please uh, circle B, please do that if you feel that way. Uh, it, it would be helpful if you could give us an idea of what, you, what your other ideas are. Um, you could share that right there on the back, that'd be great. So they'll be around after the service at morning tea. Please get those in if you haven't filled, sent, if you already sent me one, don't need to worry about it, but if you haven't, uh, please do that. Um, also, just a reminder that the rosters are coming up soon and so for, for next term. And so if you're a regular member, uh, again, if you're interested in being involved in a ministry, please uh, let Mich Michelle or myself know. Um, and particularly when, you, when you're unavailable, this uh, information that came out with the bulletin, I think, this week that showed, tells you what to do about that. Um, also, I've got a uh, message from a visitor who's going to share something with us. Dear friends. In the Gospels, we see that it's Jesus' way to meet people in their places of deepest pain and crisis. His response would always generously consider the felt needs of the people that he passed by. But Jesus had much more than that to give. Jesus gave people more than food, more than healing, and more than comfort. In his love, he addressed the deepest needs of a person's soul. We might think of the paralysed man in Mark chapter 2. Jesus heals him and he walks, but not before Jesus has forgiven his sins. At Anglicare, the urban mission arm of the Sydney Diocese, we're working in the same way. People come to Anglicare in need of food, but we know that they're more than a hungry mouth. Anglicare seeks to minister to the whole person. They develop a relationship with that person, offering a pathway out of social isolation. We provide wraparound supports, including casework and counselling and financial assistance. And they experience the love of Jesus in kindness and respect. A person may come for food, but they walk away with more than that. Please join with me in praying, supporting, volunteering and giving to this worthy cause so that we can offer people welcome, love and hope to those in need. Please partner with Anglicare to reach people in Jesus' name and see lives transformed for his glory. Now, that says please donate before the 30th of June. It's clearly past the 30th of June. Uh, but basically, the reason we wanted, to, we wanted to show that is because uh, this morning particularly, we're very much aware of how crazily cold and wet and windy it's been. And I don't know about you, but I'm incredibly thankful to have a roof over my head um, and to be able to drive a car that gets here with you know, without too many leaks, that kind of thing. Um, we, we have so many great blessings. Um, but it's also important for us to recognise that there are many people in our culture who don't. Um, and one of the things that Anglicare does um, is to, uh, to care for those who are most in need. And so the Anglicare Winter Appeal is on at the moment. And so if you're really thankful for what you've got, maybe you'd like to consider con uh, supporting the, the uh, Anglicare um, Winter Drive. 
Um, and so you can you can connect to it with the Angler Hair website and uh, do it online. It's probably the easiest way to do that. Um, so although it's past the 30th of June, um, you won't be able to claim it on this year's tax, but maybe for next year if you wanted to do that, you can. Um, so prepare, get get in early for next year. Um, but yeah, if, you, if you're able to help, that would be really great. Um, now, if we go to the next slide, please, Beth, thank you. Um, at the beginning of the service, I asked you these two questions, which are gonna appear on the screen magically. Why do you believe in God? Why do you go to church? Now, uh, as, as we, we're thinking about this our outreach mission in September, a lot of people kind of say, well, I find it hard to talk to non-Christians or people who aren't Christians about my faith. I find it something that's really difficult for me to do. Uh, now, if you find it difficult to do, then that's not, you're not alone. You're not Robinson Crusoe. We all, we all find that difficult at various times. Uh, and one of the reasons I think we find it difficult to talk to people who aren't Christians about our faith is because we actually sometimes find it hard to talk to each other. Um, and so what I'm going to ask you to do, if you've had a chance to think about those questions, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to turn around. If you're, a, if you're sitting next to your spouse, let me encourage you not to share it with your spouse. You can talk, about them, talk to them when you get home. Okay? Um, but maybe turn around or maybe you might want to get up and move. We've got a few visitors here. You might like to come and, and say, introduce yourself, uh, an opportunity. Um, if, you don't, if you don't feel comfortable talking about this, that's okay. Uh, feel free to say, I, I don't really want to do that. Uh, but I want to take, give you an opportunity just to spend some time thinking, why do you go to church? If somebody asked you that question, what might you say? Because we've all got a story. Like sometimes we think, well, I don't know. If somebody might ask me a question I don't know the answer to. You know, why is, you know, why is there suffering in the world? Or what about science and religion? And or all those kind of questions. We think, oh, how do I answer those questions? Well, questions like this is a question we could all answer because we've got a reason. I mean, we're all here this morning, so there must be some reason why you're here. <laughs> uh, and so that might be something that you can share. So let me encourage you just to spend a couple of minutes turning around, talking to the people next to you. Why do you either believe in God or why do you go to church? Again, so either of those two questions. Um, let me encourage you to do that. And then after a couple of minutes... I'm going to ask Barbara to come up, and she's going to lead us in prayer. How did you find that? Excellent. Yeah? It's actually really encouraging, isn't it, just to, to share with each other. And I think sometimes we don't do that in church. We, we come and we, we do church, and then we go home, and we, and we talk about our weeks, whatever. We don't necessarily share with each other, you know, how we got, came to be here. And that's actually a helpful thing to do. So if you didn't get a chance to finish because the annoying person at the front cut you off... Um, <laughs> We have morning tea after the service, so please um, hang around. You might continue that conversation with that person. Or if you start a conversation with someone else, why don't we say, oh, what did you say? Um, and it is helpful for us to... I, I'll, I'll get you a second list, but... Uh, um, but, yeah, it is actually helpful for us, I think, to, to prepare ourselves. Because in the end, as we're sharing our faith with, each other, with others, it's not about us having all the pat answers um, or the, the perfect kind of spiel to give to people. What we're sharing is a, a, the saviour that we love. Um, and the salvation that has been given to us. And so it's helpful for us to think about, you know, why, what does it mean to us? Because that's going to be one of the things that's going to be most powerful. Liz, can, you briefly answer? can I briefly answer those two questions? Um, probably not briefly. Um, why do I believe in God? Okay, I, I, I will too, well, why do I go to church? Because I'm paid. Um, no. <laughs> no, well, actually, probably the, 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 former, the first question is probably, for me, um, precedes the second question. I go to church because I believe in God, I guess, is the answer to that one. Um, and I believe in God, I think, because as I look at Jesus and what Jesus has done, that, that rings true for me. And I re recognise that Jesus' death and his resurrection is something I can't ignore, that it says to me that Jesus is somebody more than just a, an ordinary religious leader. He, he is God. Um, and as he dies, for, dies, he says he dies for me to give me hope of eternal life. And so um, it's, it, to me... As somebody who did with science in the past and whatever, the mathematician, like, like the, the logic of it stands up for me. And that's one of the things that is most significant for me personally. That may not be the same for you, but that's, that's one of the things that impacts me. I'm going to invite uh, Barbara up. She's going to lead us in prayer. Uh, and then after that prayer, we're going to go straight into our next song, which is called Grace Alone. So. Thanks. Um, you may have had an opportunity to read the bulletin, the front page this week, uh, a lovely article written by Marilyn Sloan, um, quoting the Archbishop, but also on the topic of reconciliation, uh, particularly because this today is the beginning of NADOC week, so that's going to uh, inspire some of my prayers at the beginning for us. So shall we pray? First of all, a prayer... Um, written by Michael Duckett, who was mentioned in that article. 
Dear Lord and loving Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy shown through your Son, Jesus Christ, who came not to condemn the world, but to save it. We take time to remember the children who were stolen from their families and suffered the loss of culture and identity. We acknowledge the grief and loss suffered by many of these families. Father, we pray for them, ask that you might bring hope and healing to each of these children and sometimes who are still struggling today as adults. We pray for peace and comfort to be upon the families who are still waiting for their loved ones to return and ask that somehow, Father, that you may reunite these broken families. May you bring healing to the broken-hearted, hope to the hopeless, and love to those who have never experienced true love. May you grant us all hope for the future in Christ Jesus, and we ask all these things in and through the special, precious name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And Lord, as we think about NAIDOC Week, we also remember the Shoalhaven Aboriginal Church in Nara. And we thank you, Lord, for these faithful people who trust in you and for their perseverance and faithfulness during this time without a permanent minister. We pray that you will raise up a godly, well-trained and wise Aboriginal minister for this church and ask for wisdom for financing and housing. Especially we praise you for the real spiritual growth that has taken place in the Thursday night men's group and pray this may continue. Also, we pray that you will hear and respond to their prayers for outreach and how best to connect with families for real gospel growth. And Lord, as we f reflect, we also reflect that these are some of the things we should be praying for ourselves here at St. George's. We pray that we will read and hear your word and respond to it in faith and trust as we seek to walk with you each day. For our own mission and outreach in September, that you will lead us to connect with people and families in our town, that you will guide us, Lord, in whom to ask along, and please be preparing hearts to respond to your word in faith. And Lord, also please help us to make good and wise decisions about our own building projects, and that each of us may honor you in the way that we discuss and go forward with this project. We thank you, Lord, here. We thank and praise you that we have Steve and John to minister to us each week and have the continuity of faithful biblical teaching. So we pray for Steve and Lorna, John and Fiona, for wisdom and strength for all that each week brings to them. And please sustain them in this ministry to which you have called them. And Lord, it seems appropriate today to pray for our Archbishop Kanishka Raphael. We thank you for the way in which he is leading our diocese and for his public statements on being a Christian, which encourage us in our walk with you. In particular, we thank you for his article on reconciliation, titled Walking Together on a Journey from the Heart, that is quoted in this week's bulletin. Also, his, for his support of Anglicare, as it helps needy people in the film we have just seen. We ask, Lord, that you will continue to give him great wisdom, compassion, and humility in this vital role in your church. In our own country, we pray for the governments, our governments. In this time of heightened world tension, please, Lord, help them to be wise, considerate, and compassionate, making decisions for the good of us all. Especially, Lord, we are conscious that many Australians are finding life tough at the moment for those experiencing financial difficulties, homelessness, illnesses of all types. We pray that you will sustain all who work in these demanding areas for doctors, nurses, paramedics, counsellors. And in particular, we pray for all aspects of the work of Anglicare as they support those who are going through various hardships. May they, may they find relief from their difficulties and see a reflection of Christ's love in the action of their helpers. And as we look to our greater world, Lord, we know that you tell us in your, world, in your word that in our world 
There will always be wars and rumours of wars. But Lord, there seems to be so many places of conflict and suffering around the world at the moment. We bring before you the people of Ukraine, their terrible suffering and plight, and ask for an end to conflict in that country. For the people of Afghanistan, after the earthquake, drought, and the effects of the Taliban government, the people of Sri Lanka facing an economic collapse, and many other places in the world that are in great need. We ask for help and provision for these countries, for the work of aid agencies like Anglican Aid and World Vision. But Lord God, our Saviour and Redeemer, we thank and praise you that in the midst of life difficulties, we can take great comfort in knowing that we can completely trust in you and your perfect will for our lives. And just finishing with these words from Joshua, may we love the Lord our God, walk in all his ways, obey his commands, hold fast to him and serve him with all our heart and soul. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Oh
have a seat and we're going to have our two Bible readings. The first Bible reading comes from <coughs> Mark's Gospel and Jesus and the disciples had been to the temple and there was some discussion about the beauty of the temple and then Christ went up to the Mount of Olives and the disciples asked him some questions and the chapter is now titled The End of the Age, The Signs. So Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming, I am he, and he will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginnings of birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and <coughs> flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you who are speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death, a, child, a father, his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing, it does not be long, where it does not be long. Let the reader understand let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no, one the, let no one on the housetop go down or enter the house or take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to collect their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this, not, this, that this does not take place in winter because those days will be of distress and equal from the beginning when God created the world. And until now, there will never be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At the time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or... Look, here he is. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive. If possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth and from the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs gather, get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my, word, my words will never pass away. Here ends the reading. My reading is Revelations 6. The seals. 
I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a voice like thunder, Come! I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown. And he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come! Then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come! I looked, and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. And then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine and plague and by the wild beasts of the earth. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony that they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, Sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to earth as late figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Sometimes when you get up to preach, you just think, Well, I don't really need to say anything, it's just so obvious. Sometimes not so much. Um, for those of you who are here for the first time or haven't been here for a while, uh, we're in the middle of a series looking at the book of Revelation. And uh, it's one of those books that people find very difficult to understand, and uh, sometimes we do too. And as you heard that reading, I don't know what, your, what kind of thoughts came to your mind. Uh, but let's, we're going we're gonna to look at it today, so I'm going to pray, and then uh, I pray that God will speak to us. So let's, let's come to God together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for the opportunity to be here and for the opportunity for you to hear you speak. Lord, I pray that you would indeed do that now. Um, help me to speak truly and clearly. Help us understand uh, what's happening in this, uh, this passage um, and so that we might be encouraged, that we might be strengthened for our walk with you, uh, and then we might trust you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you know that my memory is pretty terrible. Um, I remember when I was young, we had this game called Remember, Remember. Um, I don't know if you've seen that game. It's one of those games where it's got little cards that you put down on the table and you scatter them around and you've got to turn them over two at a time and you've got to try and get um, pairs. You played that game? Um, it's called Memory, I think, nowadays. I've played it with my nephew who just flogs me every time we play. It's really embarrassing. Um, but anyway, it's good to have a good memory. And so just, I want to just test, test yours for a moment. Um, we started looking at the book of Revelation and there are a couple of important things for us to remember uh, about the book of Revelation. 
how we understand it. The first one is that when we look at it, it's important for us to, to concentrate on the, to not get too caught up in the detail. We're going to be looking at two chapters today, chapter 6 and 7, and we're not going to be looking at every single uh, dotted I and cross T uh, as we go along. We're going to try and stand back, a bit like when we had that image of the picture uh, of the Monet, where the best way to look at a Monet to understand what's happening in it is actually to stand back and to get, get an idea of the whole picture. And so we're going to do that today. We're going to take a step back from our passage. Uh, we will be looking at some of the details as we go along, but just so that we can really understand what the, the whole thing is trying to say to us and how, how it can speak to us. So it's important for us to remember the big picture. Second thing for, for us to remember is the structure of this book. It's actually very tightly kind of structured. And so, so far, I won't test you because I know it's Sunday morning, it's a bit hard. Um, but in chapter one, you may remember we saw a picture of Jesus. He was standing amongst the lampstands, which are uh, symbolic of the church. Uh, and we saw that how glorious Jesus was. But the reason we saw that vision is because he had something to say. And so in chapters 2 and 3 of, of Revelation, the Jesus that we see, see in chapter 1 says something to the churches that he's standing amongst. And of course, that's a picture of him speaking to us. He's, he, he's got things to say to us. And we looked in chapters 2 and 3 at some of the amazing things, that, some of the challenging things that Jesus had to say uh, to us and to Christians throughout the ages. And then last week, we, we looked at chapters 4 and 5. And we saw, you may remember, that heaven was opened. And in chapter 4, we saw a picture of who? God on his throne. So we saw God on his throne and there's all these elders around the throne and they're worshipping God. He's worthy of worship because he's created all things. In chapter 5, somebody else appears. Who is that? Jesus, the lamb. That's right. Um, he's described as two things, both the lion and the lamb. And he is also worshipped. Okay, And we're going to see why. We'll remember why. Well, why, was, why was he worshipped? Can you remember? Because he was slain. And so therefore, he is, he is worthy of doing something, opening the scrolls, because we saw some scrolls, and we'll get back to that in a moment. So that's where, we were, where we're up to. I want, you to, I want to have to skip to the end, because at the end of the book of Revelation, there's two big sections. One section is a picture of judgment of the world, the final judgment. Um, and then there's this beautiful picture of the new creation. Okay, that's where the books get, that's where we're headed towards. Um, but before we get there, from chapter 6, sorry, I'll move it down. From chapter 6 down to chapter 16, there's this cycle of four, four cycles of seven. Um, so there's uh, seven seals um, in uh, chapter 6 and 7. There are seven trumpets that are blown in chapters 8 to 11. Uh, there's seven signs that come after that. And then there's seven plagues or seven bowls that come after that. And so we see um, there's, a, there's that cycle. And what we're seeing in these cycles is... Um, not something that happens, all of this happens, and then all of this happens, and then all of this happens. They're not consecutive, but concurrent, which means they don't come one after the other. They, they're actually looking at the same time, the same kind of period in time. And a bit like this. Does anyone here watch the cricket? When you see the cricket and a wicket falls or something like that, what do they usually do? Well, they jump up and down. But well, if, there's, if there's a kind of disputed uh, wicket or something, they show it from the front, and then they go to the side, and then they go on top and then they kind of get the x-ray vision out and they show all that kind of stuff. And they show all the different camera angles um, of the same scene. So even though you look at the front and then you look at the, the back and then you look at the side, it's not as if those things happened in order like that. They actually were four pictures of the same thing. Um, it's a similar uh, thing. I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Vantage Point. Um, it's an it's a older movie now, but it's actually a great movie because it's, it's, a, picture, it's a movie about an assassination of a political figure um, and it's viewed from um, about four or five different angles. Uh, you see it from different, through different people's eyes. And as the movie goes along, um, you, you get an idea of what actually happened because only, each person can only see a certain part of the picture. It's actually a really interesting movie. But that's kind of what's happening in these, in, uh, these cycles of seven that we see. There are four, four of these cycles, and they're all looking at the same period of history. They're looking, I think you were going to find, at the period of time from when Jesus died to the time when Christ comes back again. And as we're going to see today, each one of them looks at it with a slightly different angle or a slightly different focus. And today we're going to be looking at chapters 6 and 7, as I said, and they're going to give us a particular focus on, what, uh, on that period of time, the period of time that we're living in right now. Okay. So we need to remember the, uh, 
the structure we need to remember to stand back and, and look and admire. The third thing that's going to be helpful for us to remember is what happened last week. And we've already mentioned it, that in that picture we saw of God on his throne um, and the Lamb, there was something. There was a, a little thing that um, became really significant. It was the scroll. Because God was holding a scroll that was written on both sides. And we kind of thought about that. What on earth is that scroll? Why is such a big deal being made of it? And we went somewhere to find out what that scroll was. was. Can you remember where we went? The to the Old Testament. And often as you read through the book of Revelation, it's helpful for us to look back in the Old Testament because the Old Testament helps to unlock it quite often. And we saw that both the prophet Ezekiel and the prophet Zechariah had visions of a scroll that was written on both sides. And in both those situations, um, they were messages of judgment from God, judgment on, on his people or judgment on sin across the world um, that, was, that was coming. And so we're kind of expecting that this is going to be a message of judgment. In fact, actually, actually what we're going to see is that is exactly what it is. As each of these scroll, as each of these seals is broken open one by one, another element of God's judgment is coming out. We're going to see a different aspect of God's judgment. Now you know when, where God's judgment started, don't you? Where did it start? Can you remember? Garden of Eden, that's right. Back in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve kind of turned their back on God, the natural consequence of their sin uh, was to, to was, instead of having the blessings that they had, was to receive the curses. And so you may remember um, the curse of the land being uh, now being hard to work and it being child being childbirth being painful, then being rebooted out of the garden. But most significantly, um, the judgment was that they were going to receive death. That's part of the consequence of our sin. And that's why our world is as it is. In fact, Paul says in Romans 1 verse 18 that the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. The wrath of God is being revealed. In other words, as we look at our world, one of the things we see is the judgment of God. Now, that's really what we're seeing in these, these chapters. Okay? And so chapter 6 and 7, let's, let's go get to them. Uh, we'll try and go through them as quickly as we can um, to get a big picture of what this is. Uh, what, how does God show His judgment here? And I'll get you to have a see if you can uh, get, 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 work out what this is. So as the, the seals are broken, a call comes out quite loudly, clearly from the Bible reading. Um, <coughs> the call comes out for 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 riders for horses to come out, and each one bring, releases a different rider. The first one is a white rider. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow. He was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. Now, we, we know that we've seen before the colour white is, a, is symbolic of victory um, or conquest, and so that's, that's, that fits in with the rest of the picture. What does that sound like a picture of? It's maybe, maybe Jesus? We're going to see Jesus on a horse a little bit later on. I actually don't think it is Jesus at this particular point. Because this rider has a bow in his hand, crown on his head, and he rides out as a conqueror bent on conquest. It's a picture of, of world leaders, of political leaders, as they go out into our world uh, bent on conquest. I mean, we've seen, that, we've seen that every now and then, haven't we? Throughout history. I don't know if you can think of anyone, any national leader who's decided they want another piece of land and they, they decide to send in tanks. Anybody heard of that happening? Yeah, It's happened once or twice throughout history. And that's, that's what we see. It's a picture of a rider going out bent on conquest. And when they do that, one of the ways they... also It's a picture of victory or conquest. That's the first rider. The second horse that comes out is a red one. Because when, when the conquerors go out to conquer, how do they do that? Do they do that by um, showering flower petals everywhere? They do it, they spill blood. They go out and they, they cause war, they cause conflict. And that's what we'd expect. So in verse 4, another horse comes out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make people kill each other. To him was given a large sword. It makes sense, doesn't it? If the, the rider comes out on conquest, he's going to be accompanied by conflict, by battle. Um, and then there are other things that you expect to come with it. And so as the third seal is opened, we then see a black horse. This black horse um, has a pair of scales in its hand, which you kind of think, well, that's a, that's a weird thing. Maybe it's about kind of justice, like the scales of justice. But it doesn't sound like it's justice because it then goes on to talk about shopping. 
two pounds of wheat or a quart of wheat for a day's wages, six pounds of barley. Um, they're the kind of quantities that you need for, to build, just to make a loaf of bread. And so basically, uh, what they're saying is that now a loaf of bread is going to cost at least a day's wages, if not more. Because often what comes when, when there is warfare, when the, con- when the riders go out for conquest, there's often famine, there's all, often want. Now, at the end of that little passage, that little cry, there's the do not damage the oil and the wine. And it's one of those passages that kind of go, oh, commentators have different ideas. Some say it's just it's an example of uh, there being kind of a mitigation and kind of a, okay, there's, there's, there's famine or there's, there's drought, but not in everything. But others kind of suggest that maybe it's um, uh, that the, the, the rich people have the things that they want, the luxuries, the oil and the wine. There's plenty of those around for them. It's kind of a uh, let them eat cake kind of idea, <laughs> um, the, where all the common people are struggling, uh, the, the rich have what they need, the leaders have what they need. Whichever way, it doesn't really matter, but it's, it's a picture of, um, of famine, it's a picture of, of there being need, because that's what happens, isn't it? When the riders run out, uh, there's, there's a shortage of food, there's a shortage of all the bare necessities of life, and, and normal everyday life is difficult. You look at the people in, in the Ukraine at the moment, how difficult their life is just to get down to the shops to get a, to get a loaf of bread. Uh, it's difficult and it's, it's hard to actually get it even, even when, if you can get down there safely. And so with all of those things, with the rider riding out in conquest, with the, the battle or the conflict, with the famine and the want, what would you expect next to come? The fourth rider, the pale rider comes next. Um, <coughs> Some of you will have recognised that movie. Um, I looked, there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was following close behind him. Um, the rider is Death because that's what, that's what happens uh, when leaders go out in, in search of blood, in search of, uh, of, of conquest. There's, there's uh, a lack of peace. There's uh, a lack of uh, resources. And, of course, it ends in death. These pictures are a picture of our world. Part of the God's judgment on our world is what we see here. When we see um, the Roman Empire, when we see Genghis Khan or Napoleon or Stalin or Hitler or Pol Pot or Saddam Hussein or, or Vladimir Putin, when we see them going out like a white horse on a white horse ready for conquest and bringing all these terrible things, um, this is not a sign that the end is about to happen. Uh, in fact, Jesus says uh, in our first reading from Mark 13, you can expect to see wars and rumours of wars. He's saying exactly the same thing as in Revelation 6. You can expect to see wars and rumours of wars, but that doesn't mean that the end has come. It's part of what's what happening in our world because of our sin. Because notice who's in control of all these coming, things coming out. Who is the one that releases the riders? It's God, isn't it? It's the Lamb as He broken, breaks open the seals, and they are they are summoned. They are given the tools of the trade. They are given the sword. They are given those things. This is part of God's judgment on the world. Um, that's exactly what God says uh, in Rome, or Paul says in Romans chapter one, uh, when he says uh, part of God's judgment is actually leading, leaving us to the consequences of our action, giving us over to the desires of our own hearts. In Romans one verse twenty four, when you reject God the God of life and love and peace, what do you get? Well, you get hatred and war and death. That's what you get when you reject the God, the, the God of love. And that's what we see in our world. And so when we look at our world, one of the thing, reasons this is given to us is to encourage us to remember that although our world is full of pain and conflict, it doesn't mean that everything is spiralled out of God's control. In fact, God is very much in control, even of this. Even of this. And it's, it's great. In verse, verse 8, we're told um, that they were given power only, of, only a, a fourth of the earth, or a quarter of the earth, to kill by the foot. They're, they're limited. That God doesn't just let this go open slather. Um, that, that God puts limits on, on this, in his mercy, in his kindness. Um, as people live out that, that re- re- rebellion of God... Um, and experience the judgment, there is, there is a limit to it. Um, but, of course, as we think about these things, uh, it's not, these are not like the plagues that, that uh, came upon the people of Egypt. You remember when the, when the plagues come on Egypt, 
um, like the frogs and the floods and all those kinds of things. Um, when the plagues came, they came on the Egyptians, but largely the, the Israelites, God's people, was, were free of that. They didn't experience it. Remember that? Um, God kind of protects his people from that. So can we expect that here? Can we expect that the world's going to suffer, but Christians are going to be okay, that everything will be fine? Well, when we see the next seal, uh, when the next seal is broken, we get the answer to that. The fifth seal is opened. I see under the altar the souls of those who have been slain because of the word of God and the, uh, and the testimony they had maintained. It's a picture of the martyrs. That in the midst of all this suffering and death, even Christians, and in fact particularly Christians, uh, will also suffer. Uh, we can expect that to be the case. But even here, God is still in control. As the, as the Christians or the martyrs cry out to God in verse 10, how long, O oh God, when are you going to um, bring, bring justice to the earth? Uh, when are you going to end our suffering? The answer is not, well, don't worry, this won't happen again. You guys have died, but no others will. No, he says in verse 11, just be patient because there's still, there are still more who are going to have to suffer, sadly. There's still more who are going to have to suffer and die. Um, and it, it, it will, this will keep going until the full number has come. But even there, God is in control. It may seem like when the church is being persecuted and Christians are being arrested or killed or whatever, you say, where is God? Where is, it's like you know, the gods of the world have, have, have been victorious. But no, even here, God is in control. And he is in control even of the number of those who have died. And so in the first five seals, we see this picture of our world as it is. In very graphic kind of language, it's a picture of where there is warfare, where there is hatred and there is death. And even Christians will experience that. Um, And so now as we come to the sixth seal, something big happens. See if you can work out what it is. I'm going to read it again. And you might like to close your eyes and see if you can picture it in your mind's eye. In verse 12, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to earth as figs dropped from a fig tree then shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. What is that a picture of? As you stand back and look at that picture, what is it a picture of? The end of the world, isn't it? Like it's, it's cataclysmic kind of language. You know, stars being fall, falling from the sky, the heavens being rolled up, all the mountains being moved from the place. I guess he, one of the things he uses, he uses the imagery that would have been quite um, well known by them. It, wasn't, it was only about 10 years earlier, 10 or 15 years earlier, um, that Mount Vesuvius erupted and, and uh, flattened and, and covered those uh, Italian cities. So they would, have, they would have been very um, familiar with the whole idea of the sky turning red and things falling from the sky and, and everything kind of shaking. They would have been... Uh, but this is the same kind of picture that Jesus uses uh, in Matthew chapter 13. It's the same kind of uh, imagery that Jesus uses of, of the end of all things. Uh, in that chapter, Jesus got a, a number of things in mind, actually, I think. But one of the things, of course, is the second coming. It's the end of all, all time and the final judgment. In the end, God will put an end to all that suffering. That we see this world that we're living in and we cry out, God, how long? The answer is not indefinitely. The answer is there will come a time when it comes to an end. This will be brought to an end. And on that day, uh, there will be no kind of big bravado, people standing up against God or or anything like that. Um, People will cower. And so in verse 15, it says the kings of the... It's interesting, he starts from the top. The kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, uh, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid from the caves. Uh, they say, fall on us, hide us. Um, it's almost like um, those who have brought the suffering on our world, the kings and their princes, will be the first to be judged. The ones who have taken away the peace in our world, who have brought, who have been agents of the judgment of God, the judgment will fall on them first. But all people will have to stand before God. Which is a bit of a scary picture, don't you think? You look at it and you go, my goodness, this is like things falling from the sky, whatever. And the, 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 the question at the very end of that chapter is, is a good one. Who can survive this? Who can withstand it? Who can stand in the face of all of this? And that's where chapter 7 comes in. 
Chapter 7 is the answer to that, to that question. And it's actually, as you, as you look through these cycles of sevens, um, they, they all have the same kind of pattern. They have six things, and then they have a little interlude. And then the, when the seventh thing happens, so when the seven seal is broken, basically what it does is it just takes you to the next cycle of seven. just starts the next thing. Then you see six things, there's an interlude, the next one takes you back. Okay? Does that make sense? And so what we're seeing here is the interlude, and it's the answer to the question, who can stand on such a day? And so let me read for you um, who it is. I'm going to read from verse 2. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice the four angels to be given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. As the angel comes out and as the judgment is coming, he says, Let's just, hold, just hold everything for a minute. Hold on for a second. I've got something I've got to do. And he's got this seal, he's got this stamp, if you like, and he goes and he seals the servants of God. The answer to who can stand, it is the seal of God, the people who have been marked by God. And the number, he says, uh, who are these people? There's, he says there's 144,000 of them. That, that number, if you've ever had JWs come into your door, uh, they, they've got this idea that this is the number of people. Right? the number of people who are going to be saved, which is a bit of a problem because there's millions of Christians across the world at the moment, so it's a bit of a problem. But um, <coughs> that's because they misunderstand this passage. We've already seen the number 12 is significant. You may remember we saw it in chapter 4 and 5 that there were tw- the 12 represents the covenant people of God. And we saw in chapter, five, chapter 4 the 12 covenant people from the uh, Old Covenant and the 12 from the New, making 24, so the people of God from the Old and the New Covenant, um, all together, before God, worshipping him, we saw them. Now, he, he multiplies, rather than adding, so I don't know how good you are at maths, but um, 12 times 12 is 144, right? Um, and so he does that, I think, because he's trying to make the number bigger. It's 12 times 12 times 1,000. You know, when you, when you ask a child to say, what's the biggest number ever, they say 54,100,001, right? That's the way kids, they, they just use this big number. And I think that's really what num- the number 1,000 is like. It's just, it's just huge, just big. And so you've got the covenant people from old and new together, and they're multiplying, and it's as bigger and bigger. It's huge. We've got 144,000 of them. He's not saying that this is the, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 100. 139, oh, I can't even do it, um, that, that big number just before, and then 144,000. Um, he's, he's not counting them like that. Because it's, it's like in chapter 4, or chapter 5. In chapter 5, when he, sees, when he hears about um, the one who can open the, the scrolls, he hears it's the, the Lion of Judah, remember? The Lion of Judah is, is worthy. And then he looks, and what does he see? The Lamb of God. He, he hears... The Lion of Judah, he looks and he sees the Lamb of God. It's not because they're different. They're the same. The Lion of Judah and the Lamb. Same thing here. In verse, uh, verse 4, he says, I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000. Then when he looks in verse 9, what does he see? I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. This is a picture of us. It's a picture of Christians throughout the ages. We are the seal of God. We are the ones that are, are protected here. We've received, says Paul, the seal of the Holy Spirit as guaranteeing our inheritance, he says in Ephesians 1. Um, we always have been and we always will be, for, be the people of God. From before the creation, God chose us to be his people. We do not need to be afraid. So why, why are we sealed? Well, we're sealed particularly that we might be protected. When we look at these images of the end of the world, we think, wow, my goodness, you know, sky, you know, stars falling and mountains rolling up. and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, It sounds scary. But we don't need to be afraid. We are protected by that seal. In the same way that Cain was protected by the mark that he received in Genesis chapter 4, he was protected from from that fear. We don't need to be afraid because God's judgment uh, will not fall on us because it's already fallen on Jesus. We don't need to be afraid. In fact, we can look forward to this time with joy because have a look, check this out, 
what it's going to be like for us. In verse 15, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the centre of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. What a beautiful picture that is. Isn't that awesome? That is our future. That is our hope. That is our sure and certain hope, says Peter. Because we have that because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. We don't need to be afraid. We can actually look forward with joy. In the, in the midst of a world that is in pain, we know that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. That's what this vision is saying to us. Don't be afraid. Don't be, don't be shaken by the things in this world. They have to be here. It's part of God's judgment on our world. But God will put it to an end, and on that day, you will be saved. But they're not just saved just so they can hang around and uh, have a crack of tinny or something and just pat themselves on the back. No. What are they doing there? Well, what they're, they're holding palm branches, um, not because it's hot and they need to farm themselves, but because they want to praise God. And so in verse 10, they, work, they cry out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They recount the gospel to each other. They remind, they remind each other how it is that we got here. We got here because of God. Salvation belongs to him, to, to God and to the Lamb. That's how we got here. And when they remind each other of those things, well, the natural response to that, of course, is to worship. And so in verse 12, they say, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honour and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. They just keep going. They continue the song from chapter 4 and 5 <coughs> of worship to God. And that is our future. That is our hope. That is our life now. That's one of the reasons why we, we say creeds. It's one of the reasons why we meet together as God's people. Um, we come to remind each other of, of the gospel and to praise God because that is what we were created for. Chapter 6 and 7 of the book of Revelation are a bit weird, let's face it, when you look at them. But actually when you look, look, look clearly at them, I think, you can see that they, their message is actually quite clear. Our world is a world of pain and suffering, war and strife. We see it in Ukraine, we see it in Afghanistan, we see it in Yemen, we see it in Nigeria, we see it all over the world. Um, there's something like 27 um, active conflicts in the world at the moment. Um, I don't know what you think when you see that. You think, man, the world's just spiralled out of control. Where is God in the midst of this? Well, these passages, these seals, these, these visions say, don't worry, God is in control here. Our world is just as it has to be, as a response of, as a consequence of God's judgment on it. But this judgment is limited, and one day Christ will return, put an end to all of that, and bring us home. That's our hope. That's our future. So don't give up. Endure with patience and worship God, for he deserves it. Let me pray. Dear Lord God, we praise you because you are the one in control of all things. Um, it's a bit of a mystery to us how um, you can be so loving and good and there still be kind of bad things happening in the world, but we know that it's because of our, ju of our sin. It's judgment on our sin. And so, Lord, we pray that, that in the face of that, the world will sit up and take notice. While there's time, we pray, Lord, that they might come to you. Lord, thank you for choosing us and, and for sealing us with your Holy Spirit so that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to worry what's going to come. We don't have to worry about judgment because we know that you have rescued us and we look forward to the day when Christ comes and takes us home. Help us to be uh, ready for that day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish off our service by singing a song that reminds us of that day to come. Uh, so please stand and we're going to sing We Belong to the Day. Belong to the day, to the day that is to come when the night falls away and our Savior will return. For the glory of the King is in our hearts. On that day we will be seen for what we are. We belong to the day, let us journey. Our salvation in our 
us as the judge in the power of his word. Bring us down in salvation while we pray. For the day when Jesus comes, we'll be close our service by saying the grace together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Let's have some morning tea together.